Hi, and welcome back to The Housekeeper's Diary by Wendy Berry. Now, in this video, I'm going to give you two chapters to make up for the one you missed out on when I was crook. So you get a bonus chapter in this video. And we're going to launch off with chapter 12, and it's entitled The Blue Room. And it's quite spicy. Now, this chapter actually opens up with Wendy Berry saying that word had come back from Sandringham that the Christmas with the then Prince Charles and Princess Diana was absolutely horrific. Evidently, the squabbles and everything was incessant, made everyone's Christmas at Sandringham a complete misery. Prince Charles actually stayed back an extra few days and Diana headed back to Highgrove. So, you know, misery, misery all around. And Wendy Berry says that she was in an absolutely foul mood. Now, all the staff were absolutely dreading because there was supposed to be a weekend coming up where they were going to have guests at Highgrove and Charles and Diana were supposed to entertain these guests together. Now, as you know, in previous chapters, they hardly ever entertain together anymore. And so the staff were absolutely dreading it, hoping that there wasn't going to be a big embarrassing squabble actually in front of guests. Now, the guests were the brewery owner, Peter Greenall, and his wife, Claire, and they're going to arrive on the 26th of that month in January, and also Spike Milligan and his wife, Sheila. Now, that is a dinner party that I would love to go to. Spike Milligan would, it was evidently absolutely hilarious on this weekend. Now, Michael Fawcett, who was then Prince Charles's valet, and Wendy Berry had the job of actually unpacking for Spike Milligan and his wife, Sheila. And they noticed that Spike Milligan had packed a formal black tuxedo and his wife had a beautiful formal evening gown. Now, they were a little bit worried because that wasn't normal for Highgrove. People didn't dress at Highgrove like they would dress if they were visiting the Queen, for example. It was a lot more laid back, a lot more casual, unless it was specifically said to be black tie. So Michael Fawcett, worried, went up to the then Prince Charles and said, oh, look, we've noticed that they've packed really formally for dinner and we don't want them to be embarrassed. So Prince Charles heads up the hall to see Spike. Charles had no intention of making them ill at ease. In the end, he himself walked up to the couple's room to find Spike struggling with a starched collar and shirt. Guffaws of laughter could be heard as Charles explained that there was no need to dress up for dinner, however good the food and service was at Highgrove. And then Spike said, but you're the bloody Prince of Wales, he said laughing. If I can't wear it with you, where can I wear it? Good point, good point. So in a pair of cords and a smart casual shirt, Charles welcomed them into the sitting room for pre-dinner drinks. Spike, in black tie, so he wore it anyway, kept Charles, Diana and their guests in stitches for the rest of the evening. I must come here more often, he said as he left the following day. It's been my best audience to date. And then Wendy Berry goes on to say that a few weeks later, a plaque actually arrived for them to put into the room that Spike Milligan stayed in. And it read, Spike Milligan slept here. And it was put in the blue room on the mantelpiece next to the enamel solar clock, which Wendy Berry says rather breathlessly was worth 45,000 pounds as a wedding present. Now, she points out that Diana left soon after the Milligans and Charles later that evening, but they said they were all surprised and happy that the prince and princess had presented such a united front, eating and entertaining together. But it was not to last. Now, over the next few paragraphs, we find out that Ruth Wallace actually, wrote, you know, handed in her notice as nanny for William and Harry. And William and Harry were back at school and Diana missed them terribly. Something that was interesting was she invited her niece Beatrice to stay with her because Fergie was heading off to New York yet again. When Beatrice was little, Fergus was off a lot on a lot of jaunts, let's say. So um, Charles went, went, went off to Switzerland and Diana didn't go because she claimed she had engagements at home, but they just could not stand being anywhere near each other. And she says an interesting thing, and I feel like I remember this, but I don't know whether I'm making it up. But there were severe flash floods in Wales around this time. And 
Charles cut his skiing holiday short and came back and Diana joined him and they toured around, you know, sort of inspecting all the damage and offering comfort to the people in the tragedy. And everybody sort of commented on how hostile they were towards each other. They could barely stand to look at each other. And I feel like I remember that. Let me know down below if you can remember the flash flood visit with Charles and Diana in Wales around this time, 1990, early 1990, and whether you can remember that, because I feel like I can remember that. That and the Kuwait trip, I really remembered the hostility. So then time goes on, it gets to about April, and the staff get word that the boys were coming down with Diana with no nanny and to expect three other guests for the weekend. Now, one of these was James Hewitt. <laughs> Now, James Hewitt arrived early in his TVR sports car and immediately came through to the staff pantry. We all liked him, said Wendy Berry, and he knew he could just relax in our company. Well, Diana comes into the kitchen and says, oh, James, blushing as she came through. Sorry I wasn't at the door. I didn't hear you come in. Now, the prince was away at Sandringham. The boys were off playing outside by themselves. So Diana and James went for a walk and then they came back for tea. And when Wendy Berry brought something into the drawing room where they're having tea, they both stopped talking, waited until she put down whatever, and then she heard them resumed once she left the room. So no other guests had arrived at this point and with no nanny on, it was left for Diana to put the boys to bed. She bathed them, read the story and then came down to join James in the sitting room. Both were still alone. Now eventually two other guests did arrive but Wendy Berry doesn't say who they were. And James Hewitt was put in the blue room so that's the one with the Spike Milligan slept here <laughs> on the mantelpiece. And the other guests were put in the green room and she points out that the blue room is just a few paces away from Diana's room. Now, all of you listening to this now are saying, well, we all know she was already having an affair with James Hewitt by this stage, you know. But Wendy Berry didn't know. Wendy Berry was rather innocently thinking that it was just an innocent infatuation. She had her suspicions, but they were about to be confirmed. So... The next day, she goes to, you know, tidy up and clean all the used bedrooms. The green room was immaculate and looked as if it had hardly been used, as did the nanny's room in the nursery. Now, I can't work out why the green room was hardly used. Unless the guests just pretended to stay and then snuck out. I don't know. You know, the other two guests she doesn't mention. Hmm, don't know. It was the state of the blue room that surprised me. Now, here we go. This is where you're going to have to be careful. If you're having an affair and if you've got a housekeeper, be aware that they are taking notes and it may end up in a book at a later date, unless you have a watertight NDA. <laughs> there were strands of hair on one of the pillows in the blue room and evidence that some sort of activity had taken place on the bottom sheet. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. Wendy, that's off. I looked at the sheets and raised my eyebrows. I bundled the sheets into the wicker basket. I'm so glad she, she, she changed the sheets. I made up the bed for the next lot of guests. As far as I was concerned, it was going to be a secret. Well, evidently not. <laughs> In a best-selling published, banned in the UK book, but never mind. Maybe she wasn't thinking of writing a book at that stage. There were to be other visits from James Hewitt over the next few months, but none that appeared to lead to such dramatic conclusions. So there was no more bottom sheet evidence <laughs> over the next few visits. That's so off, isn't it? Oh gosh, what an invasion of privacy. So Charles came back from Sandringham the weekend following James Hewitt's stay and she, he didn't say anything but Wendy Berry says that there was a lot of tension and barely disguised anger which surprises me because clearly, I mean, in the chapter before, we know that Charles has gone off to Italy with Camilla Parker Bowles and Andrew Parker Bowles 
And, you know, Diana was very upset about that. And presumably everyone knew that Diana was having an affair with James Hewitt by this stage. So I don't really understand this barely disguised anger. I mean, really, they both need to grow up, don't they? They just need to face facts. Anyway, enough lecture from me. On I go. So Diana waited until Charles left for Italy again before coming up with the nursery. Whenever she came with William and Harry, they always said she was coming up with the nursery, even though William and Harry were definitely at school at this stage. So all the staff were invited to have a PIMS in the garden with her. Now, I read this out because this is really fascinating. Diana wasn't a big drinker, but if she had a PIMS, it used to loosen her tongue a little bit. And she started telling the stories to staff that maybe she wouldn't normally tell. And this story was about Michael Jackson and Elizabeth Taylor. So I thought I would read it out because it's actually quite juicy. The princess told fascinating stories about what she thought of stars like Michael Jackson and Elizabeth Taylor. And this is what she said about Michael Jackson. You should see his nose, she exclaimed to Michael Jackson. It looks as if it's about to fall off because even with lots of makeup on, you can see how thin and brittle the skin is. Oh, now you've, I've heard rumours about that, but I've never heard anyone actually say it, that I guess you could rely on what they're saying. If that's the case, isn't that awful? Isn't that absolutely awful? What a tragedy. I was a huge Michael Jackson fan. I remember getting ready to go out for teen parties with Michael Jackson off the wall, blaring out on my record player in my room. Happy times, happy times. Now, what she said about Liz Taylor, she was truly impressed by Liz Taylor and said she would like to look as good as a star when she reached her age. Now, to finish off this chapter, Charles actually put in a natural raw sewage processing system and Wendy Berry said he used to drive the staff mad because whenever anything big like that happened, he would always just disappear. He would go off. He would make sure he wasn't there. <laughs> for all the teething problems and there was all these new instructions and one of the new instructions were that Wendy Berry had to tell visitors that they could not put condoms down the loo anymore they had to put it in a separate bag <laughs> in a rubbish bin so um, she was quite embarrassed and didn't quite know how to approach that task but evidently it worked really well, this natural sort of raw sewage processing thing. It's, uh, it's a, a reed bed system, all following along organic principles, and evidently it worked really well. She said it, it worked extremely and surprisingly well, although the chefs found it hard to get used to, to the new composting system and everything. And then she says... Um, something really tragic happened, which you would know of, we all would remember, when Prince Charles had that dreadful accident at Polo and actually badly broke his arm. It was on Thursday, June 28th, and there was actually a big occasion about to happen that night at Highgrove. There'd been dozens of people invited, and um, Charles's private secretary actually stepped in for him and the party still went ahead. And Wendy Berry and Paul Burrell were running around all the guests and they were really concerned about Prince Charles because they'd seen it on the tally. And as you know, it was a shocking break, really bad. He had to go in for surgery. And now we get on to the next chapter because this is actually going into chapter 13. So this is your bonus chapter. And this is titled Sympathy for a Broken Arm. Now, the staff got word that Charles wanted to convalesce down at Highgrove. So they were all ready to greet him. And this was in the middle of summer. And it says that Charles looked miserable and dejected. He'd been let out of hospital at 11.15 a.m. on Sunday, July the 1st, Diana's birthday and he'd been driven directly back to Highgrove. And she said everybody was trying to raise his spirits and he was lying in the nice breezy hallway on this day bed, but he was obviously in a lot, a lot of pain. 
So there was lots of visitors. All his friends were determined to cheer him up. Every day there was a visitor for Charles. There was Geoffrey and Jory Kent, the Van Cutsums, and Camilla Parker Bowles came almost daily, cementing herself as Charles' number one friend. Well, I thought she was already cemented, but never mind. The Sunday was spent quietly and morosely with Diana, and Diana unfortunately took the tack of saying pretty much, oh, well, I guess you'll give up polo now, now you've had this dreadful accident. And when you've had an accident like that, although it's, you know, practical what she's saying, it's not what you really want to hear at the time. Evidently, she wasn't showing him a lot of sympathy. <laughs> so <laughs> he was getting more and more morose. Although Wendy Berry does say the princess did seem genuinely concerned about her husband's injury, but there was a lot of I told you so's in there as well. So it was really hot being July and because Charles had cancelled most of his official meetings, he wandered around the house and garden in shorts and casual shirts. Now his arm was immensely, immensely painful and he had a doctor, Dr David Mitchell, who's supposed to be a charming man with film star looks on regular call and many of the local community around Highgrove actually bought their herbal remedies for the prince to use which he you know loved because he was into natural homeopathic remedies. So with the prince out of action and very much down in the dumps his close circle of friends had organized a rota or a prince sit. Now she then says quite a cute thing about Camilla Parker Bowles. Camilla Parker Bowles, dressed casually and somewhat shabbily in a floral skirt and cotton top, would speed up the back drive and let herself onto the terrace through the time walk. Charles was always relieved to see her, taking her by the hand and kissing her firmly on the lips every time. One day, as Charles waited on the terrace for Nicholas Soames to return from a phone call, that's actually Winston Churchill's grandson, who's a great friend of Prince Charles, Camilla poked her head out of the French windows and seeing the coast was clear whispered hello darling how is my favorite little prince today <laughs> that was my favorite little prince <laughs> and then at that point Charles stripped off to the waist and wearing shorts looked around in surprise then seeing who it was laughed the security camera was off Thick Italian sunglasses hid his eyes. Take off your glasses, Charles. I want to see your eyes, said Camilla softly. I am frightened to let you see what my eyes reveal, said Charles. <laughs> oh, these two. I mean, it's quite cute how romantic and how passionate and how in love they were. I mean, it's like some bad B-grade movie, isn't it? Then Nicholas Soames comes back in, gives Camilla a big bear hug because he absolutely loves her too. It's interesting that in an earlier chapter, which I forgot to say, Nicholas Soames' first wife was actually really chummy with Diana and they broke up. Nicholas Soames and his first wife broke up and prior to them breaking up, she used to visit Diana a lot at Highgrove and go for long, heartfelt walks with lots of D&Ms and everything. So I don't know. I think, you know, it's like Diana, if she was going to break up with Charles, she wanted everyone in her orbit to also break up as well. <laughs> it just seems like she was very encouraging of people breaking up because there's Fergie and Nicholas Soames' wife. And anyway, it's interesting that Charles's hatred of smoking was suspended for Camilla. And she puffed away, putting the butts out in a collection of ashtrays arranged, arranged around the terrace for her benefit. So he didn't care about it when it came to Camilla, which is true love, I guess, true love. Now, she says a lovely, charming story about the Queen coming to visit Charles. On Sunday, July the 15th, the Queen paid a visit shortly after lunch. The Queen arrived dressed in a headscarf, tweed skirt and red jumper and was immediately ushered through to the terrace by Paul, who'd worked for her for many years and he actually started at Buckingham Palace as a walker for her corgis. So he was quite close to Her Majesty and they had a special sort of relationship. Now, it's 
it's usual that you wouldn't address the queen and you wouldn't talk to the queen as you're walking her through. You just wouldn't unless she addressed you. And even then it would just be brief pleasantries about the weather. But Paul Burrell took upon himself to say to the Queen, Your Majesty, the Prince is being so brave, but he's in terrible amount of pain, he said, without being asked as they walked through the hall. I know he will be so pleased that you've come to visit him. I was astounded at Paul's casual manner and didn't detect a hint of annoyance in the Queen's tone as she thanked him for showing her through. Now, I think the Queen was quite relaxed with staff, particularly if it wasn't on a proper occasion, a formal occasion. If it was just private, just her and a member of staff, I think she was quite happy for them to chat. And I think that she would have been quite welcoming of Paul Burrell showing that amount of care and concern for the then Prince Charles too. I mean, it's something a mother would want to hear, wouldn't it, that the servant cared, or oh, member of staff, sorry, not servant, we don't say servant, that a member of staff was concerned about him. So they sat outside on the terrace eating daintily cut cucumber sandwiches and a specially baked Victoria sponge. Charles had put his shirt on and was sitting upright and the Queen chatted quietly with him. And Wendy Berry said they both looked strangely glamorous in their sunglasses. And the conversation was punctuated with little bursts of laughter. Tigger and Rue played at their feet and seemed to initiate a lot of conversation and the Queen at one stage picked Tigger up and looked at her rather closely. So that's interesting. And then she goes on to say that the Queen Mother also visited him. But then there was a contrasting sort of visit when his father, Prince Philip, deigned to visit him. And James had told Wendy Berry, James is Wendy Berry's son, and James had told me a story from his early days in the household that illustrated the Duke's attitude towards Charles. So, but I'll tell you about the visit at Highgrove with the broken arm first, then I'll go into that story because I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So Prince Philip leapt out of the car and dashed through into the hall. Charles, where are you? He shouted as he made his way to the terrace. And the prince looked altogether smaller and slighter than his father with the two of them stood together. So how are you feeling then, you old idiot, laughed the Duke. Bloody stupid fall in the first place, if you ask me. Now, Wendy Berry saw Prince Charles recoil as Philip went on and on as to the reasons why he shouldn't have come off the horse. Now, probably Charles was feeling a little bit sensitive because he still was in great pain and the arm was not mending very well. Now, Wendy Berry points out that he meant it lightheartedly as just banter, but she said Charles did not appear to be feeling up for banter. The two went for a walk around the gardens and returned after 20 minutes after a very brief tea. The Duke ordered his car and was... <laughs> Telling it back to Windsor. They may have been really awkward with each other in those days. Um, Prince Philip really couldn't understand all the difficulty between him and Diana. He was of the opinion where you just suck it up and you do what needs to be done and you've got your two heirs and, you know, just put a sock in it basically. So he wasn't overly tender and sympathetic. Obviously, um, Prince Charles got closer and closer and closer to Prince Philip, particularly uh, just before he died. Evidently, they were really close and had come to an understanding. Well, they'd had a lot of years to resolve all their difficulties by that stage. So it all ended happily. But at that stage, yes, I don't think the Duke was overly sensitive at that point. So this story that James told Wendy Berry about <laughs> The Duke of Edinburgh, I don't know why I'm laughing, but he just makes me laugh because he's just, he just manages to put everyone's back up the wrong way, doesn't he? James had told me a story about the early days in the household that illustrated the Duke's attitude towards Charles, and it did not seem to have altered much. It was a few days before Christmas and the royal family were gathering at Windsor Castle. As usual, all stops had been pulled out for Princess Margaret, who, as the pudding bowls were cleared away, grandly continued her conversation with Prince Charles. She paused briefly for a sip of whiskey from a glass that had been constantly refilled throughout the meal. 
It's exactly as I thought, she barked imperiously, her fingers fiddling with a cigarette and a long holder. I told Lilibet at the time that something needed to be done, but would she do anything about it? Not a bit of it. Now, the Queen had been talking to Prince Edward and she sort of listened in on this and more or less said, what, 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 Margaret, what should I have done, what? And then Charles said quietly, Mummy, I wish you had got my ears pinned back when I was a child. It would have made life so much easier, you know. I don't think you realise quite how beastly it is to have ears like mine. James carried on clearing away but was fascinated by the 30-something prince talking so candidly to his mother. I'm not going to go on about it, Lilybed, Margaret continued. (laughs) Evidently she was. But I don't think you can deny that I told you so all along. And this is when Prince Philip interrupted, probably to get his wife out of a tight spot. Ears? What's wrong with your bloody ears? Interrupted Prince Philip. For God's sake, man, pull yourself together. Whereupon everyone at the table just roared with laughter. And footmen jumped to attention behind each chair while the royal family let their napkins drop gently onto the table and the floor as they made their way out of the drawing room. So life went on and Charles slowly started getting better, but he was still in a lot of pain, a lot of pain. And it, but he was about to go off for a, another summer holiday, a few days by himself, to Spain. And uh, Diana walked into the kitchen and said, oh, he's still feeling rather sorry for himself, isn't he? Now, a new nanny appeared, Jessie, a large woman like a battleship in full sail. And she was a cockney and she used to call a spade a spade. And she used to be trying to feed up scrawny little Prince Harry. (laughs) That little boy doesn't want pasta and vegetables, she would announce. He needs steak and potatoes and good old British stodge. What really upset Jessie was Charles' ability to excite the boys just as she got them settled in for the night. And this is what she said. Now, I'm not going to try and attempt to do a Cockney accent because I'm going to sound like Dick Van Dyke in Mary Poppins, which is really that bad. But she said, they are mental, you know. (laughs) She would say about the prince and princess tapping her head. Those boys are going to need a lot of help if they're not going to end up as barking mad as their mum and dad. (laughs) So that's the new nanny. So she did call a spade a spade, didn't she? Meanwhile, Diana was quite upset because James Hewitt had been posted overseas and there was developments in the Gulf. Um, After Iraq invaded Kuwait, James Hewitt, who was currently stationed in Germany, was in line to be sent there should action be taken. And so for the first time, Wendy Berry is saying that Diana's showing a lot of interest in politics at that point because she was really, you know, worried that he was going to be sent into battle. Now, Charles, meanwhile, had an Australian physiotherapist called Sarah Kay, who was evidently a marvel. He went into hospital, had to have another operation. He had to have a metal plate put into his upper arm. I mean, this was really bad. And she was a delightful person to have staying in the house. She was filled with energy. She ran a clinic off Harley Street, but she actually more or less came and stayed at Highgrove and put him through private physio in order to get him better. Now, William was nervous because he was due to start boarding school in a few days' time. The princess, like I said, was plunged into despair because of William's departure, but also worrying about James Hewitt and the Allied forces potentially doing a land invasion of Kuwait. Um, Charles returned to Highgrove for lunch with Diane and William before he went off to boarding school. And he asked, William actually asked, where have you been, Papa? And his father said, I've been up in Scotland walking and fishing. And then he warmed to the subject and started to try and sort of tell William about it. And Diana looked very offended, got up, I'm, excuse me, darling, said Diana to William. I've just got to go and make a telephone call. And she left the room with her face like thunder. So from that, I guess we can assume that it wasn't only Charles on his own 
up in Scotland. And even to this day, you just know that Camilla and Charles have such an affinity for Balmoral and love being up there and in Burke Hall, don't they? So it must hold a lot of really happy memories for them. And obviously for Diana at the time, no happy memories whatsoever. But the irony is there she is really distressed about her boyfriend about to have to be with the Allied forces invading Kuwait. So it's such a strange situation, isn't it? It's such a strange situation. Anyway, the saga does continue. We're on to 1991. And in the next video, I'll be covering probably a couple of chapters again, chapter 14 and maybe 15. And this one is titled Deadly Hostilities. And this is quite poignant, actually, because this is the first example in the book where we see William really sort of caught in the crossfire between the awful arguing and his mother sobbing and all that sort of thing. And that is described in vivid detail in the next chapter. So I hope you will join me and I can't wait to see you then. A Gossip Before Bed will be back next week. I'm back on board. Thank you so much for being patient with me while I was crook. I really appreciate it. And I really appreciate all your beautiful messages and lovely support. It just meant so much to me. It really, really cheered me up. Anyway, I'll see you again really soon. Bye.